Martina, what's wrong with you? <laughs> um, myself and Catherine, we're sitting here. Do you mind if I eat my sandwich? No, we're oh. having coffee here, myself and Catherine. Right. We're, we're sort of at home half the time, and we decided that uh, we'd have our Christmas night out, myself and Catherine. So it's just you and Catherine? Yeah, That's kind of a very my, small party, my, wasn't it? Yeah. She's my best friend. Are you lesbians? <laughs> no, absolutely not. Okay, sorry, sorry, go on. Anyway, uh, we decided we'd have our night out. So we went for a meal and uh, then we headed in uh, to town and we headed to the Cliff Richard concert that I'd had tickets for. Yeah, so, so, why, so, so, so while my son was heading off to see the game, you motherfucker, uh, you were heading off to see Cliff Richard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, and it was great. It was a brilliant night. We mm. were up on the, on the balcony near the front and uh, he was absolutely, I mean, he must be about 62 at this stage and he... You know, and where his hoes and his bitches and all the hoods and the homeboys and all these Yeah, people. he had all his dancers and everything with yeah. him. It was, it was really fabulous now. Mm. But what I was wondering, like... I've well, seen I mean, the Cliff Richard show a couple of years ago. In fact, um, my Doherty and John McColgan kind of dragged me along to it. And I remember going, what's wrong with these two? Are they mad? No, they're and not And do you know what? No, it, was, it was great. It was great. Yeah, it was really good. Mm. But anyway, um, what we were wondering about, it was... We were waiting for all the oldies, you know, all the oldie Cliff Richard songs. Mm. But he actually sang a whole pile of new stuff. Oh, well, I mean, shoot him. No, no, that's okay. But why haven't we heard it on the radio? Why haven't you heard these songs on the radio? Oh, well, you know Cliff believes that there's a kind of an international sort of ban on his songs. Well, why is there an international ban on his songs? Uh, well, because he's not getting down deep and dirty with the bitches. What bitches? The bitches and the hoes and the hood. What do you mean? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ah, uh, that's terrible. Yeah, but he well, needs, he great. really needs um, a newsy sub- submachine gun. He needs, uh, he needs to call himself Notorious Cliff Richard. And uh, Notorious Big Cliff, I think, would be the way to go, okay? Ah, uh, yeah, but it's terrible, because we, we were at his last concert, or at least I wasn't, um, I was at his last concert. And um, he said this at the concert. Oh, no, I know. He's obsessed with it now. I know. <laughs> this but is actually, a... no, he didn't say it last night. It's a big... Well, I'm glad he didn't say it last night because no, maybe he he's didn't. getting treatment. Um, yeah. the, the, the guy believes, and I have to say, he kind of proved himself correct in terms of Radio 1, in um, not Radio 1 here in RTE, okay? Though I sometimes listen to the music in Radio 1 in RTE. It's more, more progressive than some of the music we play. Um, but... Uh, he was right in terms of the BBC. The BBC had kind of just cut him out. It's this, very this, sad, though. Cause this we was a guy who was selling huge amounts of record. Yeah. Uh, basically, I think what happened was they changed the kind of the way that the, uh, the, the way BBC Radio 1 operated, right? Remember when all the old fellas were chucked out? Yeah. Or pretend that they resigned and left, you know, they were in fact chucked out. Okay, so what happened was they turned it into a kind of... Uh, you know, sort of more heavy duty, more progressive, more contemporary. And Cliff just did not fit in there. So it's only like, if you're going to hear Cliff, you'd, it would be Terry Wogan who would play him. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's just a pity. And Terry, I think, is allergic to Cliff. That's, you know, that's a problem. <laughs> uh, but all these lovely songs, and we were waiting for Sing one of them for me. Sing, sing a Cliff song, will you? Sing a Cliff song. Yeah, and, and we'll... Well, tr- actually, he had some Chris... Well, he had a lovely new Christmas Mistletoe one. and Exactly. Wine. It was a 21st century Christmas. It was a lovely... Yeah. It was a lovely new song. Really nice. Um, but he didn't sing Mistletoe and Wine because he had his new song. <laughs> so he was trying to plug that. And did but he it, sing an awful lot of new songs? He did. He really did. See, I, I hate that. 80% of his stuff was new. I hate that. I hate when the guy comes in and goes, Hi, Dublin, David Bowie here. I've got a great new album called My Arse and I'm going to sing a whole load of tracks off it. And you can just feel the whole theatre going, Oh, God, no. Why isn't he doing Life on Mars and, you know, Aladdin yeah. Sane and stuff like that? I know. Most of them have learned, in fact, that the hits are what people want to hear. Yeah. Well, no, he did sing some hits, all right. Did he but do it, Summer Holiday? No. What? No. <laughs> he didn't do no, Summer Holiday? No. Is your mate uh, there? Well, yeah, she's okay. going to talk to her. Yeah, no, get her as well. Hold on a yeah. second, here. Hold on. Catherine, here. Good morning, Jerry. Good morning, Catherine. How are you? I'm oh, good, 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 good. Yeah. Well, we're wondering, will you play 21st Century first, or would you be fired if you did play it? If I, if I played a Cliff Richard song? Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm not sure. There's, there's a team of legal people actually working on what it takes to get me fired at the moment. They're getting closer. I think they might have an answer by January 1st. Yeah, I'll play it. Sure, of course I'll oh, play it. You're yeah. great. We'll be deeply indebted if you do. Yeah, but, but I want the two of you to sing a little bit of Summer Holiday for me, though, before I take the ad break, OK? OK. OK, off you go. One, two, three. We're all going on a summer holiday. No more worries for a, a week, week or two. two. Fun and two. laughter on a summer, summer holiday. holiday. Making all our dreams come, come true. true. For me and, and you. you. Amen. <laughs> very, very, very good. I saw, uh, was it, it was Gabe Orm was writing the paper the other day. He said, some fellow was giving out about me. He said that Jerry Ryan is crap. All he does is get owl ones on with the Excuse smell of, we, with the smell of wee off them, singing songs to them. And Gay was defending me. He was saying, I was doing that 25 years ago. It worked 25 years ago. Why shouldn't it work today? Well, we've another bit to go before that. Jay. Absolutely. Good morning. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> Oh, yes, 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 yes. Tina, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning, Jerry. I'm fine. You're annoyed, though, aren't you? Yeah, I am, yeah. Well, <laughs> Very annoyed. I have annoyed. to say, kind of with some, uh, some good reason to tell us what's uh, troubling you, missus. Okay, well, the situation... Oh, hold on a second, just hold on a second. Okay. Lorraine, yeah. leave Santa sack alone. <laughs> Your time will I love come. the diamonds. Yeah, you want the diamonds, yeah. do you? <laughs> yes. Um, what's troubling me is that uh, in the last, say... 10 years or 13 years since I lost my sight, I've just noticed that um, Irish people are not as You courteous. lost your sight? Yeah. I lost my sight 13 years ago. What happened? I got a viral meningitis oh, out God. of the blue. And I had been living in Spain and I had to come home to Ireland and start again. So um, in my years now, are I have you, a Are you completely blind? Uh, I am, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. I have a guide dog and uh, I go to work and I work in um, a company called Ahead in Blackrock mm -hmm. and I travel on the train, mainly the Dart and I've just noticed over the years that instead of people being nicer in this booming economy, they're getting much worse and there's, it doesn't matter if you've no legs or no arms, you don't get a seat on the train, you know, it doesn't matter anymore it's, and it's just and it's, quite it's, it's quite obvious that you're blind, is it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. I've got yeah, a so really large black Labrador so with a yeah. sign on him saying, please do not disturb me. I'm and are you so. doing the Andrew Pacelli thing, you know? <laughs> you'd be kind of, uh, uh, no, I'm, I'm blind. Um, well, like staring so, out the window. Uh, well, you know, the kind of, oh, definitely this person's blind. In other words, no, when, when no. they look at you, they go, she's blind. We no. should be helping her. <laughs> no, but they don't. No, they don't help me. No, no but I don't do isn't that either. That's no. just incredible, isn't it? It is, actually. It's terrible. I mean, you know, you can laugh about it nobody, sometimes. Yeah, but, but nobody gives a... I, I mean, like, the dart is a fantastic thing. It's wonderful. I mean, it's revolutionised transport yeah. in the capital city. There's it, no doubt about that. It is, Jerry, but to a certain extent. But the thing is, they still don't announce the stops. Yeah, they should so, do that. I mean, they switch yeah. it on when they remember kind of thing. Yeah, they do it. Auto it, it happens automatically on the Lewis, I know that. Yeah, the Lewis is fantastic. Yeah. But are, they, I mean, are they polite to you on the Lewis? Yeah, the Lu well, yeah, the Lewis is I just get on, you, you can hear the stops, you know where you are, and it's fantastic. Seats are really comfortable, you know. It might, it might be crowded, but that's, you know, it's different. This is like, and I have to say, the wor I'll sound like a granny now, but one of the worst offending groups are, the you know, the ones that get on, like, from school, and the teenagers who kind of mash on, and, oh, look, it's a guide dog, as you've, you know, nearly been squashed off the dart, you know. It's a guide dog, it's yeah. It's a guide dog, right. yeah, yeah, right. and that's, kind of thing, you know, and, and it's it's just... Hey, blind lady, yeah, yeah, boy. exactly. And when we tell her it's like Bray and it's really Shane Yes, Gilles. right. <laughs> That's the kind of thing they do. Look, uh, there's George Clooney over there, <laughs> blind lady. He wants to meet you. <laughs> oh, yeah. that's not good. Sure, it's no, not. it's not. I mean, the thing is, it's terrible because, you know, when, when sometimes a terrible thing happened to me a few weeks ago, I asked people, was I near, was I getting to the stop in Black Rock? And they said yes, and I got off the station, and it was Sea Point. Oh, God. So I was late for work. I was nobody around, freezing cold. And do you know? think they did that deliberately? I think it's just because they don't care. <laughs> you know, they were, and it was. You can't blame it on. You know, I, when I asked, it was Irish people, Irish accents. So, you know, I think it's just people are just too obsessed with going to work, making money. Yeah, but you also know? they just don't give a damn. Yeah, it's a shame, though, because, you know, one thing you could always say about Irish people before was that we, we, we would have had... So what would you want? What would you want? You'd really need to have Marriage. kind of like, yeah, like that poor fellow that was murdered by those two, the Mulhalls. You'd really want to be him, wouldn't you? <laughs> just no head, no arms, no legs. Would you get a seat then? 
No, <laughs> you wouldn't. Not necessary. You, they might put you on the roof, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. They'd strap you onto the roof. Yeah. You with that's, no limbs, the roof. That's terrible. Um, no, okay. So we'll just say it. Do you know what? I have a very strong feeling and a deep suspicion, sadly, that this will make no difference. But if you're travelling on the dart, or indeed on, on the Arrow, on the Lewis, or any of the intercity trains, all of which have been fantastically improved, we have a great rail system in this country now. Look, would you kind of just try and remember that there are some people who need a little bit more insistence, maybe, than the average person? Okay? Yeah, that's, that's and great. I'm not saying you're going to get your reward no, in heaven because maybe it's not there. You're not going to get extra money. Yeah. Nobody's going to take down their knickers and give you one, right? <laughs> but you know what? It's the decent and the right thing to do. Yeah, I, I, yeah, absolutely. So if that makes a, a change, Jerry, fair play to you. Okay, well, well, well let's see. Will yeah. it make a change? Let's absolutely. see. Well, I tell you what, will you come back to me tomorrow and tell me? I will, yeah. If I'm, yeah, I will. Do you have I a will. fella, do you? Uh, no, I used to. What happened? Oh, you're blind. You lost him, you just go out there and look for him, would you? <laughs> oh, you can't because you're blind. <laughs> I'll get you one, right? Okay, that's fair enough. Okay. From Santa. From Santa. <laughs> now, do you know what? I'd better give you something out of the sack. Of course, you're blind. I can tell you it was anything, aren't you? <laughs> oh, I've got a Ferrari for you. Oh, yeah, that's what I want. I really, I don't know. <laughs> okay, let's see where Santa's going to go for this. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Oh, I think he's off again to, uh, he's off to BT's again. Very posh. That's where Santa's going. I wonder what he got you. Do you like perfume? Yep. Okay. I've got that Virawang Princess Spray. Apparently it's magical, it's mystical. Very good. It'll bring out the fearless... <laughs> It'll bring me what? It'll bring out the fearlessness in you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it'll make you fascinating. Yeah. And it'll make you dare to claim the princess in you. Brilliant. Okay. Um, do you know <laughs> That's what? It's, fantastic. It's a pleasure speaking Thanks to you. Thanks very much, Jerry. But don't let me down. If you're watching Primetime, you may remember young Jordan. And uh, Jordan, seven-year-old boy, uh, his problems uh, have been, I would imagine, the subject of many breakfast table discussions, and this is a subject that's not going to go away. Jordan's mum's on the line, Sharon. Good morning to you, Sharon. Now, um, there's been a tremendous um, response to um, your appearance, and indeed, more to the point, your son's appearance last night, and indeed the plight that you find yourselves in. For those who didn't watch the programme or who didn't get to see it, can you describe your situation for us, Sharon? Well... Jordan was diagnosed with um, ADHD a couple of years ago, you know, and... That's attention deficit disorder. Yeah, and two years ago, he's telling me. Good boy. Um, And basically, we're we're fighting for services for Jordan because we're not getting any, you know, and this is what it was about. The whole program was about lack of services for these kids. And my big problem with Tim O'Malley at the moment is, you know, he's going around today asking about waiting lists for this and waiting lists for that. We were on that waiting list for the ADHD. Who is, who is Tim O'Malley? Now, Tim O'Malley would be, I suppose, Mary Harney's spokesperson, I suppose, at the okay, moment. Right. And what's Tim O'Malley saying? Well, he's saying, you know, um, these waiting lists, you know, he, he's going to sort out discrepancies between the waiting lists. Like, we were waiting three years and waiting, we had to wait three further years for autism help, you know, for Jordan. Um, well, can you describe, let's spool back in time, he's seven years of age, okay? When did you first note that this is, this guy's different to other children and I'm maybe not sure what it is, but we need to find out and maybe we need to do something about it? Since he was a baby, Jerry, you know, you know straight away, a child doesn't sleep, he's constantly active. He wasn't contrary, but he was always on the go. And I knew from then, I mean, even as a toddler, you're talking terrible twos, went from terrible twos to terrible fives to terrible sevens, you know? And it's no joke. I mean, I, go, I did go to the local health health nurse and ask for help. And I had Jordan with me one day and he was crying and I was crying. I said, look, I really need help. 
And I was told that maybe parenting classes will be of some help, you know, and that's just not, that's a cop out, you know, that's not an answer. Well, it's also insulting as well. Of course, yeah. Um, and was, the and, and I can make, imagine, you know, your level of sensitivity was probably fairly high. Oh, you I was like devastated. I mean, belting the person who said that to you. Let me leave, like, you know, knowing that I was a bad parent, you know. This is the Sharon, kind of thing. what, describe, because we've all been through the, you know, the child throwing themselves on the ground and, uh, you know, refusing to cooperate, hiding under the table instead of eating the food. I mean, I mean for instance, last night in my own home, it was like, well, it was like up river at the Dolong Bridge comes to Dublin Zoo and yeah. nothing all that abnormal. Um, so that, except it was normal, right? So what was abnormal about your situation? Well, Jerry, we wouldn't sit down as a family now to have dinner. Because it just doesn't happen. You couldn't get Jordan to sit on the seat long enough to just eat it, you know. And he he would throw the dinner across the room before he'd sit there and eat it. You know, this is the problem. Like, he just won't sit still for five minutes. It's not just, you know, oh, he doesn't feel like eating. He just won't. He won't sit down. He, he just can't. Doesn't he have can't sit down. No. He'd, he'd be half on the chair, half off the chair. At the end of the meal, and I'm fighting with him and Jordan's with his dad and I'm fighting with his dad and... It's a big mess, you know, and the dinner just is ruined. And okay, and there's a lot of shouting and screaming. Oh, and, yeah. You know, so, you're not going to get the PlayStation if you stop. You're yeah. uh, 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 big trouble ahead if you don't. So, yeah. now, first of all, when, when did this, was it always like that? Oh, yeah, always. <laughs> when this was happening, what would he be looking at you? No, no, I mean... It's Never Jordan looking at you. He wouldn't make much eye contact now. So, so impo- go impossible, impossible to connect. Oh, uh, desperately, yeah, desperately. So what level of communication would you have during these confrontations? You wouldn't. You, I mean, I don't rise to it anymore. And, and you see a lot of parents actually would, would be looking at me when I'm, I'm dealing with Jordan and, and his behaviour. I kind of I play it down because if I rise to it, it just it increases yeah. his irritability. So what you do is you just you act really calm. You say, OK, Jordan, that's it. We're, we'll take him to another room or... You know, you've got to bring it back down to a level where at least it's quiet and you can start dealing with it then because you start shouting. Like normal kids, you'd say, you know, you start shouting and say, sit down, do what you're told, blah, blah. You can't do that with Jordan because it rises him up. And then you end up, he's shouting and I'm shouting and nobody's winning. Okay, so you're both shouting and possibly if there's others there, there's other people shouting as well. Now, how long does it take him to get upset during these exchanges? Very quickly, <laughs> You're talking no to three. <laughs> and he'll get upset. Yeah. Quite, you know. And how does he express that? It's frustration, Jerry. Will he say it? Will he will he cry? Yeah. Will he You're not listening to me. I'm trying to tell you and and trying to explain to you, he'll start shouting at me and then I I have to take it down a peg and say, Okay, I'll listen to what you have to okay, say. Okay, and when when you listen, what's said to you? Nothing. Well, he, He'll explain in, in, you know, exactly what, what he's feeling at that particular moment in time. You know, I, I'm feeling, you know, you're not listening to me. I'm trying, to, but I have to explain to you. He has to get the wor- last word out and explain to you what's going on, you know. And you have but no is, that, is that valueless, though? Is, is there any value? Does he actually have an, is he saying, I can't, because I, I, he- I heard him talking about, and he, it was very eloquent, his description of the fact that he felt yeah. that. When he when he was behaving in a way that was perceived by adults to be bold yeah. or or bad, that he that he felt he was being controlled by somebody else like a robot. Um, now was is that an unusual expression, or is, does he no. understand that? A, I mean, Jerry, we have ter- terrible problems with him in school at the moment. I mean, he cannot sit down in the classroom at the moment. He spends most of his time on the corridor shouting and screaming, and they're like his his care shouting and screaming about what. Because he doesn't want, he, does, he wants to sit in the class with the kids, but he's not able to. He can't participate in class. He can't sit down and listen. He can't concentrate. And because of that, he's taken out of the class because he's distracting and annoying the other kids. Sure. And then he's in the corridors, and that's where the problems start. I mean, he crawls along the corridor screaming and shouting, I don't want to be here. Leave me alone. You're hurting me. Now, he, the people don't actually hurt him. It's just that he has touch sensitive problems as well. You know, anyone, any little touch, anyway, if you were to hold his hand, it's it's like pins and needles to him, you know. So if someone tries to control him in the school or hold him, it's, you know, a big, big problem. Oh, you're hurting me, you're hurting me, you know, and that's screaming down the corridor. But what he'd say to me afterwards when I ask him about it, he'd say, Mommy, I don't know what happened, I don't know why. I just, I just did it and I don't know why. 
that's the way he felt at that particular time. And we, does he does he get upset about that? Yeah, I mean, he'll get into the car and he'll just start bawling his eyes out, really like sobbing his heart out because he knows the first thing I'm going to have to do is look in it like we have a notebook in his school bag, and it says exactly what his behaviour was like each day, and he knows I'm going to read that and. He has to explain to me why these things happen. And sometimes he just he's not able. He just cries. And I just throw the notebook on the ground and I hug him. I say, okay, well, forget about it for today. And do the, te- do the teachers understand? I mean, obviously, they're very frustrated. But well, they're, they- yeah, they're having to deal with it too, Jerry. you know. And, and, and I'm and looking for class, answers and they're yeah. looking for answers. And I said, I have to send him to school. And this is the school he has to go to. And I don't have any answers for you. I mean, the, the, the answers that we're given at the moment, medication. That's what the health service has given me. And as I said, that's not good enough. What are they saying, Rattlin? He's on a concerta at the moment. Which is kind of like Rattlin, isn't it's, it? Yeah, it's yeah. like an all-day release drug. And but does that have any that, effect on him? It, it controls the behaviour sometimes, Jerry, but it has other side effects, you know. I mean, he can be very down in himself. Mm. He has highs and lows. He's sometimes like a teenager, you know, with, with what, it, what it comes out with. Yeah. Um, if the medication is too strong... And when we had a problem a couple of weeks ago, the medication was so strong, it was causing Tourette's. You know, so you have other problems that are coming on board as well. And you're trying to deal with what you have. But as I, my problem, Jerry, he's on medication. Okay. That's the who, answer. Who prescribed the medication for him? Was it, was it a, the health nurse? Was it a, your local GP? Was, well, or, was it a child psychologist? Who was it? was it? His child, the child psychologist prescribed it. Now, I agreed for the medication, but the only reason, Jerry. Oh, I've, not, I've no problem with medication. I mean, yeah, I'd take donkey dung if I thought yeah. it did the trick, you know. But the problem is, Jerry, that's the only thing we're getting. Not one now, health All right, like, let's go back door. to that because this goes back to what I was talking about earlier on. There is no. We have very smart people in this country. We have great psychiatrists. We have fine psychologists. We have great academics. We are not without people who understand these issues, yeah. okay? What we don't seem to have is a communication between the various different support structures, the people who provide the money, those who are developing the plan, and those who are going to outreach into the community. Mm. That seems to be the big problem. So what I'd like to know from you is when you went along, first of all, how did you get to see this? Was it a psychiatrist or a psychologist? Um, I don't know. Child psychologist. Okay, child psychologist. Okay. So you went to see the child psychologist. Did, did they do a test on him? Did they assess him? They did, Jerry. but I mean, I was on a waiting list and I, and I was told I had to wait for the three years and I wrote a six-page letter and begged yeah. and pleaded and I said, I can't wait six years. And I actually went down to the health centre where the psychologist was and I said, look, I need to see somebody, I'm not leaving. That's how I got there, Jerry. I had to push and just say, look, I'm not leaving. We need help and we need now. And did you get suggested through your GP or what, what, what was no, the route? Well, I, I was fed up waiting. I mean, I, I was referred from the GP to, you know... A waiting list, Jerry. You and know, did I'm the not... GP give you the option of going to somebody privately? No. But I mean... Could you have afforded that? No. Okay. Right, this that's fair thing. enough. You and the rest of them. Well, that's it. You know, and I mean, the problem being, you know, you go to see, you go to the child psychologist, you're prescribed, he, they do all the tests. It okay, takes... now I just want to wheel back there for a moment now, because like, this is, a, and you know... <laughs> There are a lot of child psychologists listening at this very moment and psychiatrists, you know, screaming at the radio going, I'm in need of help myself. There's so much pressure on me. So you get down, you barge in because you've got mum, you've got oestrogen bursting out of your eyeballs and I'm going to help my child. I'll burn this feckin' place down if you don't listen to me, right? So I presume that's how you got your reaction. More or less like that, yeah. Okay, so so they bring you in, you're brought in, they give you an appointment or maybe yeah. they see you on the spot. Yeah. What no, happened? I had I had an appointment. You get an appointment. You go to yeah. see the, the child. Were you there when the psychologist was talking to? Um initially we didn't get to see the psychologist for 6 months. Because I had to go in for and For 6 months. Yeah. Well, the reason being Jerry, they go in and they they have other people that do all the groundwork. They yep. ask you what you had for breakfast five years ago, you know, this kind of thing. Yeah. They're trying to get, to, like, have I got problems, you know, has Martin got problems, um, you know, how much do you drink, how much do you eat? Oh, yeah, that's you know. Best, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, how many units, really? Oh, I see. <laughs> mm. So, I mean, that's how it starts. And then so, so having established child. that you're not abusing the child. Exactly, okay. yeah. Having okay. established I don't 
bang them off the wall every night. And, and you know. that you're not on heroin or yeah. walking the streets. Yeah. Um, well, you really do have to prove yourself, you know, you know that you're, you're not, it's not you that okay. has the problem. I mean, and I understand that. I understand that. That's, I understand that process, right? So having gotten by that process yeah. and going then to see the psychologist, we talk about medication. That's what happens there. But did you go directly to talking about medication? Yeah. What was it? Was the child not sat down for a couple of hours and put through an assessment? No. There is a standard no. assessment. I was assessed. Martin was assessed at his father. And what about the um, child? No, because they they listened to what we had to say. I mean, that's why I have a problem because no one's actually sat down. I mean, I, no one sat down. No, 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 no. Wait a second. Hold on. Even at seven, there is, it, 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 it's it's there is verbal. There's um, uh, 3D um, spatial stuff There's and there's written stuff. Was any of that done? No. No, you must be joking, Jerry. Nobody has actually spoken to the child about the fact that he has ADHD or that he has Asperger's. You know, um, that's, that's a big problem. He's left to deal with that himself and whatever I, tr- I choose to tell him about it. That's what so you're gets. saying the diagnosis was made yeah. on the basis of what you told the psychologist? Oh, yeah. Now, they did see him in action, if you want to put it in that kind of, you know. We, yeah, we that's, a good, down that's and, a good description. You know, <laughs> um, you know, he went in and, and he tore the place asunder. He threw books at them. He threw files at them. The paper they were writing on, he tried to rip up, you know. They could see by him that Yeah, so they got a good from. feel. In fairness they to could, them, they, they got a good feel for him. Uh, yeah, I mean, they did, they did get to see him a couple of times. Yeah. But they never actually spoke to him about it, you know. So they never actually had a time where it was just them and him? No. Okay. So they diagnose him with Asperger's. Okay. That, that diagnosis was two weeks ago, Jerry. Okay. And that's a... That's, a, that's a, the autistic spectrum. It's an interesting mm. condition and it's, it's a, you know, there are a lot of very talented, a lot of very creative people who have mm. that. It's, now, Jerry, it the, uh, causes difficulty that. relating to people. Yeah, but the problem with that is... He was put on yet another waiting list to see the autism team in Mead. And I pushed his, other, his own psychologist who gave the ADHD um, diagnosis and begged her, please, he can't wait. They wanted me to wait three years oh. for the autism. You know, a further, a further three years of waiting. I mean, no, 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 no. The level of ex- escalation that could take place over three years yeah. is, like, is ludicrously high. The risk yeah. is unacceptable in that period of time. Also, I mean, the damage to the family, <laughs> the damage to the family is, yeah. is, 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 is too high. Um, and, of course, this is not done maliciously. Let's emphasise oh, that. Oh, no, I know, I know that they've, yes. they've, they have their waiting lists and there are lots of kids waiting, but... You know, early intervention. Is what about to be what about? Thing to so, okay, so he's given, he's given, uh, he's given the drug, right? Right. He's given the diagnosis. You've got two things going here. What about you? What kind of coping skills are you taught? I'm just. I have to cope myself, Jerry. I have to deal with this myself. You're not asked how you are. You're not asked are you coping. There's no one coming to the door and saying, "How's it going? How's things?" You know, coming in, see, see, you're still alive. Nobody does that. It's behind my clo- my front door is closed and nobody comes near Jerry. Not one person. Because you know you do have to be trained and taught. Because you're, I've said it a thousand times. You've probably heard me say it on the program. The ability to make somebody pregnant or to give birth means nothing other than you have done that. Yeah. It does not mean that you understand attention deficit disorder, Asperger's syndrome mm. or anything. It doesn't mean anything except that you've biologically made a child. Some of us are looking we're born with instinct, okay, for certain things, but that won't get you very far with what you're dealing with. So you do not have, you haven't been trained in terms of the coping skills that are required to deal with him when these episodes take place. No. no. I mean, we, we were shown, um, you know, how to restrain him when how, he gets really bad, how uh, to restrain your own child. How to physically restrain him. Physically restrain him. And I have big problems with that now because I always knew he doesn't like to be touched, Jerry. He doesn't like the feeling of people holding him. And it's part of the Asperger's, is that they don't, they're touch sensitive, you know. And one of the, the ways we can get around that is if he can get occupational therapy. Now, that's another waiting list of three years. So I, I have big problems at the moment, you know, of a child who is hyper, and if you try to restrain him to stop him injuring himself, you have to hold him, which with the Asperger's, he doesn't like that. So I'm in a catch-22 situation. 
you know. Well, this is a disaster, basically, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, well, it is, Jerry. because... And I'm, I'm ringing around for the last two months looking to see who is the occupational therapist. And there was, like, there was nobody at that post at the moment. Either she, I think it was, she was gone on maternity leave or they hadn't filled No, the that's also going back to what I was saying earlier on, is that, you know, it seems this seems to have happened about 15 years ago where there was just absolutely no foresight exercised whatsoever in terms of the, the staffing levels that were going to be needed to deal yeah. with the community. And, you know, particularly with this section of the community, these younger people. Yeah. Okay, so you haven't been trained. No. You've got the love and affection and instinct of any mother. The child has had the two, the two diagnoses. The, yeah. It's, we've got some medication. You, you think it's escalating, it's getting worse. Well, it is, Jerry. I mean, we, even though he's diagnosed with Asperger's now, we still have to wait three years for the autism team to see him. And even at that, I'm not sure the services will be adequate. You know, there are no services for the ADHD. I'm not holding out. Well, but in three years, he's prepubescent. Well, this is it. I, I mean, mean I, that's, I said, that's, 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 that's completely madness. Yeah. That's that's like saying it's okay. The the atomic bomb. It's like the t- it, there's a timer on it. It's not going off for another three years, or we'll, yeah. we'll be grand. Well, Jerry, I'm hearing stories from mothers saying to me that their kids are being taken off lists because they're not going to get to them in time. Yeah. They will be going into adulthood. Yeah. You know, and that's that's a joke. You're talking about a child now, like Jordan seven. I have to wait till he's a teenager and he's dealing with all his hormones and everything else. Plus, trying no, to no, give no, 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 because by that by that stage, <laughs> let me, look, let me tell you. Here's the real bad news, okay? Because I've seen this. I've seen really smart, bright, intelligent children. Mm. Okay, and they are quite intelligent. <laughs> um, with no coping skills when it comes to social interaction. Yeah. The need for friendship, but the inability to. To hold on to it. Well, he's going through that now, Jerry. The inability to integrate into, um, you know, while they might have one good friend who's able to handle it and deal with it, the rest of the social group can't. So they don't get invited to the birthday parties. And so eventually the moment arrives and it's a horrible moment when you tell the parent of the child, I'm sorry, he can't come round here again. Yeah. Oh, I've had that. No. I've lost friends over things like that, Jerry. And then I've you, fallen then you, out with my parents. And then you get to the teenage year and you've got the child standing with a breeze block in his hand. The guard of the car is coming yeah. up the road and he throws it in through the front window yeah. and everybody goes, oh, what's wrong with him, I wonder? Yeah. And I'll tell you what's wrong with him because when he was seven, he wasn't taken care of. Mm. But see, the problem is, Jerry, because he doesn't look like he has a problem, people can be very dismissive and they can be very, you know... Oh, it's the parents, you know, um, it's their fault, you know. Oh, yeah, um, well, I mean, I totally blame you. You know. Completely, utterly. Yes. I'm a terrible, terrible mother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I had a man turn around to me a few weeks ago and say, Jordan threw a piece of chewing gum at him, you know. Yeah. And I said, oh, God, I'm very sorry. I said, if that's the worst thing you could do, you know, trying to laugh it off. I was told, you know, oh, God, that's some rare and you're giving that child. Yeah. And well, you know? in, in a way, you have to be sort of sympathetic because pe- most people don't understand what you're going through. They don't understand it. They just no, they, they've no. no idea of what you're going through, and in fact, I'm absolutely, I'm absolutely amazed that you sound so relaxed and so coherent. Jerry, I cried for many a year. Yeah. I'm gone past that. I'm angry now, and there's nothing worse than an angry hormonal <laughs> woman. Let me tell you. <laughs> so beware. <laughs> so Asperger's is an interesting condition because not interesting if you've got it, by the way, but. Um, it does not mean that you're not going to excel or, or, or achieve. Uh, quite frequently, these guys are, you know, very high achievers. But it does cause communication difficulties and um, establishing relationships with people can be very, very difficult. And understanding the mechanisms of relationships can be very difficult. Sharon, uh, first of all, can I just say, I, I continue to be amazed at the fact that you're so together, despite the fact that you <laughs> described yourself as hormonal and dangerous. I'm a great actor, actress. <laughs> now, what's, what's really worrying here, and you know, I, there will be a result for your son, there will be a result, and the reason there's going to be a result for your son is because of last night and because of now, right, yeah. that's what's going to happen. Somebody somewhere, you know, and I, I know what's going to happen, you know, like Tim O'Malley's not a bad guy, um, Mary Harney is, you know, a, a good friend of mine, but besides that, I also believe her to be one of the brightest and best 
in the in the business. She's a consummate politician and she's facing down one of the biggest challenges in in my opinion in the in, in, in Irish political history, dealing with the Irish Health Service as it is at the at the moment. Your, your guy will be okay. You, you're going to get the help because of the publicity. Yeah, but I shouldn't have to do that. No, Jerry. no, no, no. That's, what, mean, that's, these, that's is, what worries us all. You know, I mean, I had I had this letter sitting on my counter for a long time before I decided, well, I'm going to ring these guys. I was desperate. I said, you know, I, the last thing you want to do is expose your child's vulnerability, you know, on, on nationwide TV. But I had to do it because I'm not getting any help. Or the, I'm writing the letters. I'm making the phone calls. People are not listening. And, you know, I really want to emphasise this, you know, and this leads to terrible problems in, in later years, in teenage years, because, you know, and I'm going to say this and I'll admit it to my shame. There was one young fella in my, in my, in, in my life right now, not one of my own children, but I couldn't have him in the house anymore. Yeah. I, I couldn't have him in the house anymore. He was the brightest, smartest young fellow on two legs. He is. I, I, I couldn't deal with him. I, I just was, and I was afraid of the issues that were going to be attached to my own kids as yeah. a result of it. Now, you know exactly what I'm talking about, don't I you? I do, yeah, I know. And then I'm what happens? About- the alienation feeds yeah. into, in teenage years, aggression. It feeds into... Um, lack of, you know, the cognitive thing when it comes to making rational decisions, safe decisions in terms of your behaviour is is diminished and these children become more frustrated and they end up in trouble with the law, they end up in trouble with drugs, with drink, with all sorts of problems. And these children can be saved. They can be saved. Well, I mean, how how are you going to explain to a teenager, you know, you've got to take this medication every day, you know, that's to deal with your behaviour. Um, how are they, he's not going to understand how to deal with other other kids and other people's with, with the with the right with the right approaches with the right approaches and the right person and with early intervention that mm. will work. It, it, I have absolutely no doubt about it. We've seen it. We've seen it. We've seen the people. Uh, so a bunch of people working with children like this in Chicago, and we've seen them having such mind-boggling success. Uh, you know that you'd kind of wonder exactly why do we not just take this model and transplant it here? Yeah. Now. Your child will be helped, but the, what happened last night on the television and what's happening right now should. This can't stop here. Your Jordan is now, he's a torchbearer for all the other children who are on these waiting lists. Well, I didn't actually let Jordan watch it now, to be honest, Jerry. You he's going to find so, out, though, isn't he? Oh, well, he knows. He's looking at the, he's looking at the paper now with his picture. And what does he think of that, by the way, just out of curiosity? He, he's amused, amused by it, I suppose. He, he's able to read the article, so I might let him just take a snippet of that and, and he can, you know, think about it for a while. I mean, I've told him he, that the reason we've done this is to help kids like him who have ADHD, because he understands that he has ADHD, but he only understands this year. Because yeah. I've had to tell him little bits, you know, and breaking it to him gently, I suppose, you know, um, see how, how he reacts. And okay, let's leave him as own loan for a moment. What about you? How are you? I'm doing okay, Jerry. You know, it's it's a difficult thing. It's a difficult one to to explain. Um, you're you're dealing with social issues yourself. I mean, I don't have friends to call, that call to the house because of this. You know, and you you lose friends, you make friends, you don't get invited to parties. You do. I mean, Jerry, I can't even get a babysitter. You know, I don't go out. Socialising at yeah, night. because nobody's going to take this on. No, I mean I did get a babysitter one night about two years ago, and Jordan put a hurley through the the bedroom wall to the bathroom because he wanted to be able to see into the bathroom. <laughs> you know, mm. and needless to say, I didn't get another babysitter. <laughs> um, you just you you can't you can't leave him. You can't. You'd be on your mind all night. You just cannot leave him. You're married, you. aren't you? No, I'm not. You're not married. I'm not married. Are you in a relationship? I am. I'm engaged. <laughs> I'm, we, I'm engaged, Jerry. I'm engaged, I know. <laughs> Hello. Um, Hello. And how, how is this affecting your relationship? Well, thank God, Jerry, we're strong enough. You know, we're, we're quite strong people. That we, we put, 
stupid issues to the back of her mind and we get on with it. But is this the whole thing? Is your whole flipping life this? Yes, I'd like to be able to pick up the phone and talk to someone about perfume. About yeah. what, what somebody was wearing in a magazine. I am yeah. sick of talking about it, breathing, sleeping. So in other words, I'll tell you what you want to be doing. You want to be um, uh, going out for something to eat, go to see the Borat movie, yeah. make love, yeah. get pissed, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sleep in late. Yeah. I don't want people's reaction. Like, I can see it in their faces now when I'm going to, to talk to people, like, in the conversation or, you know, meet someone for a cup of tea. I can see it in their face. They're going, oh, please, say, say she's not going to start on about Jordan again. Yeah. Because I seem to have nothing else to talk about. And I, I wish I did have something else to talk about. But I don't at the moment. I'm just... Well, you know, it. life gives us these things. And I have found that you can become consumed by things like this. Yeah. And, yeah. And, they, and, and, you know, the big thing, watch out for this, Sharon. Watch out for this, right? I speak from some personal experience. It, 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 don't let it define you. Don't let no. it define your personality. Well, I'll tell you what I did do, Jerry. Now, this year for myself, I said I am going to do something for myself. I decided I was going to go back to college. Good for you. So I thought, oh, what like what I do? I'll do I'll go and do a special needs course or I'll go and do this, blah blah blah. And then I thought No, uh, no I no. will do something completely different. So I'm doing beauty therapy. Absolutely, girl. And I'm waxing and plucking and Yeah. <laughs> something that's completely Don't different. Be going anywhere near the other yeah, thing. Yeah. I'm doing it on Saturdays and it gets me away and that's my day. You know, and it's a release. I have to say it's a release. So, Jordan, stop. What's he's he doing? He's in the car here now, pulling out of the mirror. I have he's to say, he's been, he's been <laughs> remarkably quiet. <laughs> he has been remarkably quiet during yeah, the, this the conversation. The is a great old man. <laughs> Actually, can I just ask you about that? Does he play video games? He plays, the. he likes the PlayStation and he's getting a PlayStation 2 from Santi and SingStar because like, he likes to sing as well, so. Oh, good, good, good. And yeah. when he's playing the games, are we quiet? Oh, yeah. But, Jerry, he came in to me at half three the other morning and put his hand on me in the bed and said, Mammy. And I woke up and frightened the bejays out of me. He says, um, can you please take this PlayStation off me? I can't sleep. <laughs> he was playing it all day and all night and his, his arms were actually getting sore. He was so consumed by it. Yeah. It's like he gets really into it. So. Okay, well, um, I hope... The one thing that I've learned at this stage of my life, right, when I was younger, I used to think I, I would try and find words at the end of conversations like this that would make, um, that were magic, right? Okay, I don't have any magic words. What, what we have here, though, is last night with prime time and you now and people listening in the Department of Health, ordinary people also going, What? And there is an awareness, I hope, now that this is a problem that is not only yours, but belongs to a lot of other families who are suffering, who are going through pain. There are solutions to these issues. There are resolutions. There are families living with these problems happily, under control. And you deserve that. So does Jordan. So does your fella. And you deserve to have a life and you deserve to have a bit of crack and a bit of fun. Exactly, and hopefully it'll so, happen for well, well, and and for all the others as yeah, well, who, exactly. who you represent now. Now, do you know, I'm going to do something that's kind of a bit shallow. Right. But I, I don't <laughs> think you'll object. I'm going to dig deep into Santa's sack. Right? Oh, lovely. <laughs> I knew you wouldn't object, you know. Ooh, I wonder where he's going to go for this hormonal <laughs> woman. <laughs> this violently hormonal woman. This good mother. Oh, Santa had to go all the way to Paul Sheeran's jewellery shop for this. Ooh. It's worth 795 euros. It's 18 carat gold. It's a diamond linear pendant on a 19 carat yellow wow. gold chain. It It'll won't make... solve all your problems, but it's no, better but than it... a kick in the arse. It'll make me look pretty. Good girl. <laughs> Thanks very much, Jerry. We'll talk again soon, and I hope Take the next care. time that we do, something positive has happened. Exactly, and thanks very much for having us on. Keep the faith, girl. I will. Linda, good morning. Hello, Jerry. Good morning. It's all news to us. We didn't know anything about this bee sting thing. Really? No, never heard of it before. Wow. Your well, mother used to use it. She, yeah, she used to boil it up for us. Yeah. I think it's supposed to be 
like she, she used to tell us, um, well, you've never seen a, you know, you've never seen a weak car. They're always big, strong things, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, she she boiled it up and a, t- a curdled. I think it was like whey or something, you know, or. Well, it's colostrum, obviously, isn't it? Yeah, scrambled egg. It turned like a scrambled egg. Oh God. It was absolutely delicious, Jerry. It was delicious. It was lovely. And we put sugar in it, but now that I'll think back, you know, maybe we shouldn't have put <laughs> But being kids, I suppose, we'd put anything in it, eat it. And, you, um, and you'd get this on a regular basis? Absolutely, yeah. And where did she get it from, I wonder? Well, whenever our cows calved, right, we always had two milk cows. Yeah. Like, we hand milked them out in the buyer net in the morning. So, we, we, we took the calf from the cow, you see. You took you know? the calf from the cow, yeah? Yeah, and we'd bucket feed the calf and whatever. Yeah. So there was always loads of crossroom, you know? Why is it called bee sting, though? I don't understand that. I, I don't know. I don't. I mean, I've tried to spell it there, write it down. It looks like a terrible word. Bee sting. A bee sting. I don't know. <laughs> is it bee sting? Is it bee sting or bee sting? Bee stings. Bee stings. Like, yeah, I don't even know how to spell it myself. And you drink this as a treat without well, that. We didn't drink it. We, we, we ate didn't it. drink it. No, we ate it. Yeah, we boiled it and it curdled. Yeah, and it, it turned like scrambled egg. And we used to sprinkle sugar over it. it sounds but absolutely I, vile. I remember my uncle coming from Scotland, you know, and he was quite stuck up, you know. So we, um, everybody was at mass and I had to make him breakfast and there was no eggs. So I bought a beast. Yeah, and he didn't know the difference. Was he happy with that, was he? Well, I don't know. I think he just put it down to my bad cooking. Never said a word. <laughs> <laughs> at least he got something to eat. Now, um, God, and, uh, I think most of us could subscribe to this. Maybe you could. Uh, maybe we could get the most expensive babysitting night out ever. Okay, if you're listening, um, I'm quoting today from the Irish Independent. This is one of these headlines. When you read it initially, you go, ah, ridiculous. And then you think about maybe what you've spent recently yourself. Even this weekend, think of it. The high cost of hiring babysitters is forcing young couples to forego their weekly night out in the pub. A standard four-hour shift for a teenage babysitter will cost €40. Euros. That's uh, basically €10 Euro an hour. Would you do it yourself for less? Probably not. When the price of a taxi fare to bring the babysitter there and back is added in, it can cost, in fact, far more than the couple's actual night out. The babysitters.ie website said the majority of its babysitters expected to be paid between 8 and 10 pounds, or 8 and 10 euros an hour. Babysitters seem to be expecting a rate per hour in a similar range to other part-time jobs, such as uh, call centre work. This is probably, possibly down to the fact that most are in college and have certain earning targets for when they leave, managing director Hugh Duncan said. Um, the site has 17,000 babysitters listed, apparently, on it. Um, I'll tell you, yes, it is expensive. And you could easily, if you add in the cost of the taxi, um, well, I mean, think about it. Add in the cost of the taxi that you're taking yourself, first of all. Because if you're going to have a few jars, you shouldn't be driving. Then you go to the restaurant. What's that going to cost? Absolute 80 euros min for the two of you, minimum. Um, and then you've been out since, say, 7 o'clock, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2 maybe? 1, we'll say 1, okay. So that's 60 euros. So 60, 80, 140. The taxi into town, say 20, 160. Babysitter taxi, another 20, maybe 180. 180 euros. That's your average night out now. Um, Pat, good morning to you. Good morning, Jerry. How are you? Very good. Now, um, let's see. You think that it's a record that you've got in your hand. Well, I do. I do indeed. Well, people have been telling me that they think it's a record. My mum and dad celebrated their 73rd wedding anniversary on the 28th of November. Holy Moses. Isn't that (laughs) extraordinary? Isn't it? Well, first of all, it's extraordinary that they've lived that long. But yes, they I, will be if they see January 92 and 94. I suppose the times that we live in, people do tend to live longer. Yeah, there's a touch of the bionics about it. Well, yes, <laughs> um, particularly amongst women. 
Um, but to be married, for a marriage to last 73 years, you know. I mean, it's, uh, we stopped, even the 70th was difficult to get a card. 70 is platinum. Oh, there is a card for 70, is there? Yes, very scarce. <laughs> uh, I wonder what the se- what's the secret? Why are they still married? Well, I think Mind you, it'd be a bit late to give up now, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, that's what she says. If she knew now, what we, if she knew then what she knows that now, she mightn't have lasted. <laughs> um, well, I don't know. I think one of the secrets is they both have individual interests. Yeah. She still goes out playing cards three nights a week. I say she's better social life than I have. And, well, he does a little bit of gardening, and up until recently he was an avid fisherman, but his eyes aren't so good now. But, yeah, she, and they they read, she reads a lot, and they have a keen interest in what's happening locally and have arguments still, which I think is great. <laughs> <laughs> arguments that are resolved, that's oh, the absolutely, most important thing. absolutely, absolutely, but both There's nothing are, wrong with arguments. There's nothing wrong with a good, healthy row, it clears the air, but never, uh, I think it's something my mother said to me once, she said, never, never go to bed or go to sleep with your back turned on your partner. Well, that's true, but I think, you know, the fact that they still can disagree on things. Yeah, important, very important, and in fact agree to disagree. Yes, absolutely. They both have individual ideas. And the idea that she goes out three nights a week, you know, and has her her little, has her own little social life. Yes, and she, not alone does she play cards, but she wins. (laughs) You know, she can tell me the next day I got the 13 tricks last night, and she can tell me what she had for second last and last, which is magic. Wow, those 73 but, years. Yeah, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, we we see 50s and we see some 60s, but I don't think I've ever seen the 70s. Well, when you think about it, you're listening now to people who can't even manage three years, you know, so <laughs> well, as Mammy much says, less 73. If the dinner is not on the table, now it's nearly grounds for divorce. <laughs> well, absolutely. Absolutely. One little row, one disagreement, one falling out, and off they go. But, uh, yeah, I thought, well, the Jerry Ryan show is the perfect place to throw it out there. And well, see let's see. Let us challenge them this morning. Um, mind you, with the way things are going nowadays, I don't think uh, anybody's going to beat it, to be perfectly <laughs> honest. Um, 73 years her mum and dad are married. Can you beat that? Now, um, there can be very few of you listening this morning who are unaware of the... Uh, gangland killing of uh, drugs lord Martin Marlowe Highland. Um, There was another dimension to this killing, though, that was um, all deaths are dreadful. But this added death, the death of young Anthony Campbell, 20 years of age, a young plumber who was working in um, Martin Highland's home, um, I think adds a dimension to this story that all, almost it beggars belief. Uh, 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 you know, when you're thinking of the grotesque nature of what happened to this innocent young man. Now, obviously, the effect um, is felt all across the country in the local community, very particularly in the family and the local area. Uh, Fiona Murray from the Jerry Ryan Show is with Anthony's uh, uncle apparently this morning. Um, Fiona, good morning. Good morning, Jerry. Um, I'm here in St. Meckham's House in Greek Street in Smithfield in Dublin. It's, it's a lovely, warm community, but it's absolutely they're just torn apart. The sadness of the this morning. I, I called in St. Meckham's Church to say a prayer, and people were dropping in. And, um, and now I'm up here in the flats um, in the block that Anthony's from. I've been talking to neighbours and family, and I have Martin, Anthony's uncle, beside me here. Neighbours have been describing Anthony, or Anto, as he was known as, Blondie and all this could be the shock of blonde hair, and he's, he's two younger brothers, Travis and baby Noel, and his teenage sister Amy, and they are devastated. His whole family lives in this area, so his uncles and cousins, grandparents, and um, his own parents are here. I, I've been talking to them and relatives and neighbours, and they're all just shocked, Jerry. He was a good young fella. He was just a good guy. His uncle Martin is there, I gather, with you. His uncle Martin, and I'm going to put John to him now. Okay. Hello, Martin. My condolences, uh, first of all, and our thoughts and prayers are with you, and indeed all of your family on this awful day. Um, can you tell us how you heard the news? We were on the way out of flat yesterday. 
Yeah. We, we, as you know, a lot of the people in the flat sell, and we were on the way out yesterday. The young lad that escaped come in, and uh, his mum said, uh, "Are you looking for young Anthony?" He said, uh, "No, not really." He says, "I hope he went to work." Now he says, "He won't be on missing." So the the guards, two guards, with the young lad and says, uh, "Sit down. We want to have a talk." To you. So they said, "There's been a shooting, and he was involved in the shooting." We said, "Whereabouts is he?" Uh, he's in Fingers somewhere in the house in Fingers we didn't know at the time how bad or what, how serious it was we just said what has, what husband's guard said sit down said he's dead then. Oh. and who was this said to Martin who who had to receive this dreadful news um, it, it's, it's Anthony's stepmother received this, this news walking out to get yesterday morning Gave her the news. So we had to inform his grandmother, and his, his daddy was working in the country yesterday. So he had to come from Roscommon, and he had to be told down there. So he had to be told over the phone? Yeah, he had to be told over the phone down in Roscommon. So he meet with his job. No, he was very, very young, only 20. He's 20 years of age, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, was he, had he been long in the plumbing business? or? No, he. he at the start his apprenticeship he just wanted it yeah. he said I just want to be an apprentice for me you know yeah. and um, he was actually let go out of work and this was next he got you know to do he went out and earned a few quid for Christmas so that's so he was a young apprentice up. trying to make his way doing a world like the rest of us yeah, yeah doing a bit of a nixer to try and get yeah. a few bob so together a few for, quid for Christmas as I say yeah God now, as Fiona said, the uh, reaction seems to have been uniform right across the community there. Uh, people calling into the church to say prayers, everybody in dreadful shock. Mm-hmm. For your family, though, you well, must you must be in a state of total shock. One of your children goes to work and to be told then that he's shot dead. There's no reality that you you know. What words can say? There's just no reality to something like that. Just Mark. normal young lads, walking lads. That, that's all we are. We're all just working class people. We walk every day of the week. We money for children and try to do the best we can. And this, this happens. Martin, have the guards given you any idea as to who might be responsible for this without mentioning we, any names? Have they given you any the idea? Have, I've said nothing. Well, we're actually meeting the guards now to possibly go out and identify the body. And, um, oh, that hasn't been done yet, has it not? No. Dr. Mary Cassidy was only finished the autopsy there, so we have to go out and identify the body now. And um, God, they said they'll, they'll inform us more, they'll let us know more then. So you're going to have a chat with them after you've done that? Yeah, we're going to. Yeah, and who's, who's going up to identify the body? Well, I'm going up myself. Uh, he's daddy and he's mummy. And I, I think maybe his grandmother, I'm not sure, you know. Oh, dear God. So that's the task we have. I'd just like to say, Jerry, if, if them cowards and slags that done this are cowarding somewhere, so I hope they're very proud of themselves now. If they're cowarding somewhere and listen to this, I hope they're very, very proud and managed now and proud of themselves. That's all they are, talks and slags, and that's what they are. Well, of course, you know they were professionals, I'd say, Martin. Yeah. Real pros. That's well, that's what you're looking at there. That's what that's what we that's what I was saying this morning. That's what we've come to now, where fellas can and they walked away from this probably calmly. Well, I hope they're very, very proud of themselves. They call themselves men to kill a young man like that guy. Yeah. No Martin's walk. Who'd probably no idea even whose home he was in. He didn't actually, he had no idea. He just went, as I said, to do a little next to do a job. He had no idea who his house he was in. When will the funeral be, Martin, do you think? We, we, we're not fully aware of what's happening at the moment. As I said, we're going now. So you're only going to go and identify the body. You we're don't even know when when, when, when Anthony's know when body, body, will body, body will be released. Be released to, yeah. Well, look, I'm not going to detain you. You have awful business, okay, but yeah, pressing yeah. business and urgent business that has to be dispatched today. Yeah, yeah. okay. And, um... I'd just like to thank all 
family and friends and everyone that has gathered around. Yeah. We're very, very tight in the community, as you know, down here in the city. We just well, it's, a, it's a time. It's at times like this that you need that. Yeah, Jerry. And uh, you'll be in my prayer certainly today. Okay. God bless and good luck. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. And uh, here's a letter. We still take the letters, you know, snail mail. It may take a little longer than an email to get here. Um, I know there are even those of you who believe that it's a strong possibility if I can get here ever. But they do. They do get here. And they do land on our desk. And we're still happy to receive them. Dear Jerry, I'm writing to you about my daughter. She's just five years old and has an imaginary friend. And you might think that this sounds very sweet, and it is but I'm also at my wit's end because of it. The other day we'd been to the supermarket and we were on the way home, but we had to turn back because we forgot. Julie, the imaginary friend. So we went back in and we even had to open the back door so that Julie could get in. An extra place is to be set every day at the table for her. My daughter whispers to her while she plays and goes around the house with her. I'm worried now that she's at school that she'll get teased about it. Is it normal for children to have imaginary friends who appear so real to them? And when do the friends finally say goodbye? Don't get me wrong, my daughter is a totally normal, happy and wonderful little girl. And I wonder if other listeners remember having imaginary friends. I don't. I would appreciate if you could read this sometime, Mary. Well, yeah. First of all, we'd love to hear from you about this because I think a lot of you probably have been through this. And I don't mean that just with the child. I mean, probably you've been through this yourselves. And what did it mean? Um, it's completely normal. And it doesn't mean a child has uh, been neglected or that a child is lonely or that a child, in fact, doesn't have any real friends, you know, real physical friends in the real physical world. Um most children use imagination as a tool uh, to develop. Play is, of course, one of the great brain development processes. Um, you know, when you sit down, particularly with little girls, and I suppose boys do it the same, but just in a different way, and you hear them talking about, you know, the shop that they've set up in the hall or something like that. My little one has a shop upstairs at the moment, my little seven-year-old. And... Um, she has a keyboard. That's for when she goes online and when she does her pricing and everything for you. And it's also an agency or something at the moment as well. So you can buy stuff there, but you can also hire people, you know, to come and do things in the house for you. So she, you can get plumbers from her and cleaners and uh, and uh, nannies and all sorts of things like that. And she, she will also sell you things. Uh, they're usually bits and pieces around the house. And she does talk to people that don't seem to be there. And it's perfectly normal, uh, perfectly normal. Now, what happens with some children is that the uh, the imaginary friend takes on a very sophisticated personality. And some of you listening may remember that imaginary friend. And they're very clear and they talk and you do interact with them. And they're there in darker moments and they're there when you're having fun. And usually... The well-balanced child, by the time he or she gets to school, usually what they do is they're clever enough, you know, not to mention the imaginary friend in school. And maybe the imaginary friend will wait outside the school for them, at the gate until they come home. It's unusual that the imaginary friend comes into the classroom with them. That's quite unusual. I mean, it's not the end of the world. It doesn't mean anything radically wrong or emotionally, you know, worrying about uh, the state of your child's mental health, but usually the child will leave the imaginary friend at home or outside the school. That's kind of what goes on, usually. Um, and they can become very detailed. Um, they will know what the child, the imaginary pal, we wears. Um, they will share things with the imaginary pal frequently, you know, particularly boys try to share their dinner with them to get rid of it on occasion. They will include them in games. And as our letter writer points out, you can get very frightened sometimes if they think the friend is getting lost. That actually, usually what that means, the imaginary friend getting lost does mean something. It means maybe the child is going through a, a small little crisis themselves. Or it may mean that it's coming towards the end 
of that time when they feel the need for an imaginary friend and you find the imaginary friend gets left at home or does get lost more frequently and eventually then one day the imaginary friend just disappears. I had an imaginary friend and I can remember him as clear as day. And he looked, for those of you of a certain generation, do you remember Jimmy Vora Haig? Some of you do, some of you don't. I hear a very loud chorus of, what? No? Well, when I was a young fella in, in Mr. Jordan's class, Jimmy Vora Haig was our Irish book. And Jim Mean was a sort of a, a skinny sort of a young fella that wore short trousers and he had a little cap that he wore when he was going to school. Well, my pal was a bit like that. And his name was Sean, as far as I remember. And um, Sean, I'd, I never really talked all that much to Sean, but I had a teddy called one Eye Ted. And one Eye Ted telepathically would be communicating with me. Sean would talk with me. I know there's a selection of psychiatrists listening to this and going, ah, hmm, that all makes sense. But mostly Sean looked on while I was playing and I would tell him stuff. I'd say, well, Sean, I'm going to set up the uh, train set now. And uh, I'd show him the trains working and uh, uh, Teddy would kind of send you a message kind of saying, well, you know, let Sean have a go at this and let Sean do that. And Sean did come places with us, I remember. He came to the shops. Um, uh, he never came to school. I always left Sean at home. And I thought, there was nothing weird about him at all. But I do remember as he began to drift away, and it was just like it's described in this letter here, He, I forgot him sometimes. I'd go out to visit somebody or to visit my pals. You know, I two one two pals on Styles Road who I used to hang around with a lot around this kind of time in my life. And I'd get out there with them and I'd go, Oh, I left Sean at home. Ah well, so what? I'd go back and he'd be going, Where do, why didn't you bring me with you? And then I remember going on holidays and saying to Sean that Sean wasn't going to be able to come because there wasn't enough seats on the plane. Uh, maybe my, one of my parents must have said that to me, it, not in a cruel way, but they were probably just floating it out there to see, you know, will he will he accept this and maybe we'll get to the the end of this Sean thing because it can become a bit discommoding for a lot of families having to include the imaginary friend, for instance, at the table and going to the theatre and getting extra tickets and cinemas. I mean, it can become quite excessive with some kids, but I I just I remember saying to Sean. Uh, Look, I felt a little bit guilty. I, and to this day, I can still recall trying to explain to him why one eye Ted was coming with me. And I was saying, look, one eye Ted's going to be able to sit on my knee. You can't. I mean, you're the same size as me. And I remember walking out of 108 Kinkora Avenue and he was at the door. I remember he was at the door. I remember looking back at him. And we got into the taxi and went out the old airport road up along Santry. And of course, by the time I got to the plane, I was getting so excited about going out, he was gone, out of my head. And when I came home, he was gone. And that was the end of it. And there was nothing weird about it, nothing strange about it. That was, you know, and in fact, it's only up on very recently that I even remembered it. And I don't think that I'm that unbalanced or that disturbed or that emotionally dysfunctional or any more than the next fella. Uh, and... Th- Sean played an important, not a significant, but an important role in my life. And I think kids do have friends like that. So that's the way it was for me. And he disappeared naturally, just disappeared naturally. Maeve, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning. Okay, you? I, we were, um, at least I was looking at something in one of the papers this morning about babysitting costs. And, uh, you know, we all complain about crash costs and really we shouldn't... Co- Actually, do you know what? We shouldn't complain about anything to do with children, really, at the end of the day. They're no. meant to be our most precious commodity. But still we do because yeah. it's money. Now, um, the average... Um, apparently the average rate is €10 Euro an hour. Mm. And I was saying, well, if you added that to the taxi, to the meal, you're up around maybe €200 Euros for the night, Um for an ordinary night out, no problem. And we said, what's the most that anybody has ever paid a babysitter? Yeah, Go and on. that was us. We paid $105. What? For, yeah. her, for how long? For, for three and a half hours, from nine till half twelve. Where? In Puerto Rico. Uh, three weeks ago, my brother was getting married out there. So uh, we decided we'd uh, have a night out. 
Yeah. So we were in the hotel and they organised a babysitter and that was the charge. My God. And we had the two kids asleep. They were both asleep in bed before she arrived. That's astronomical. Yeah. And did you get any explanation? That's just, that was the charge. That was the service charge that they provided. And did they put it on the bill or did you give that money directly to the babysitter? We could have paid her directly, but we put it on the bill. And then they, they paid her out. And then we fixed up. Are you end. sure they didn't think it was a hooker that you were ordering up to the room? <laughs> I mean, that's absolutely bizarre. No, no, I know, yeah. And I, I bet you, I, I presume that you didn't know it was going to cost that. Oh, we, we did. We, the day before, we didn't know before the wedding, but we were out there and it, we decided that the kids wouldn't last the night and to give ourselves a night out. Oh, yeah, I know. We I know holiday. the feeling. I know the feeling. Yeah. 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 Uh, and um, I mean, was it the best babysitter in the world? I mean, was she a qualified nurse, a psychiatrist, a child psychologist? No, no, she was one of the cleaning staff. Right. She was one of, now, she was a staff in the hotel because we made sure and we kind of inquired and made sure that she was going to be reputable and all the rest oh, of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But. She was one of the, they said it, she was one of their in-service cleaning staff. Wow. Okay. Now, she was a nice girl. Oh, I'm sure. She'd want to be, wouldn't she, for $105? <laughs> Sitting there looking at the All right, so, class. okay, that's the first we have, and I have to say it goes directly to the top of the list. Thank you, Maeve. Uh, $105. Megan, good morning to you. Hello. How are you? I'm okay. Megan, how old are you? 15. 15. Okay, so you're right smack bang in the middle of uh, the sort of babysitting age group. You do it for a living. Yeah. How much, do you, yeah. how much do you get? Uh, 20 euro a night. That's not very much. Ah, uh, keeps me going. And how many hours would you do for that? Um, three to six, really. Well, you know in Dublin now they're getting 10 euros an hour. <laughs> where, where do you live? Longford. Oh, we're going to upset the apple cart today, aren't we? <laughs> and how did you strike that rate, uh, Megan? How did you get that rate? Um, read that. You agreed it? Yeah. Well, you're going to have to go back and tell them that it's more than that. Uh, for, for six hours, you should be getting 60 euros, for instance. For three hours, you should be getting 30 euros. Yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> that'd be good. You get 30 if you stay over. Yeah. Yeah. And wash the floor. <laughs> oh, no. No, no. <laughs> uh, but the main question, though, like, are you satisfied with that? Are you happy with that? Yeah, it's grand. It keeps me going for the yeah. week. Yeah, it keeps you going for the week. Okay, right. Well, I'm telling you, sister, there are girls getting more than that in different parts of the country. And yeah. uh, check out the uh, website, babysitter.ie, and you'll see their names and uh, their addresses. Christine, good morning to you. Good morning, Jerry. How are you? I'm excellent. Nice to have you with us. Thank you. Babysitting. Babysitting, Jerry. yeah. I, I, I mean, I suppose the point I want to make more than anything else is that, you know, when you're going out for a good night and you're, you're heading out the door and you're going to your restaurant or you're going wherever, really, at the end of the day, what's the most important thing in your home? Your children. Absolutely. You know, and, and I, I really feel that babysitters, if, you, if you're choosing a babysitter and you're getting a good babysitter, I don't believe that there is a price too high, really. I know I've certainly paid between 60, 75 euros for a night if I was going out for a night. And I mean, at that now, I'm talking about probably giving them between 10 and 15 euros an hour. Oh, no, don't. Like, that was the point. You know, I did enter that caveat earlier on. I said, you know, we, they are our well, most... Well, I felt you were in agreement with me, yeah. in fairness. The, the, they know, are our most precious commodity. It's just that I think, you know, people find themselves, you know, going out. This is a flipping expensive country, you know. It is an expensive country. But at yeah. the end of the day, I mean, I just believe there's nothing more precious than your kids. No, you you're, like you're, people you're, will leave their children with anybody when they want a night out. How many people would actually give their car away to some stranger <laughs> for the night? <laughs> it wouldn't happen. Do you know what I mean? And I think, for God's sake, let's stop giving out about it. I mean, the minimum wage is too small in this country anyway. It's ridiculous. It's a laugh. And at the end of the day, a babysitter should be getting at least 10 euros an hour. Now, I know my own daughter has babysat from time to time for people. And she makes a decision to do it for like 25 or 30 for the night, yeah. depending on how many hours and her taxi home. Yeah. And I think fair play, that's great. I'd have no difficulty with a person making any arrangement they want with the babysitter. But, of course, you find out what you're paying before you go out. 
you know what I mean? I mean, I'd hate the fact of coming home and then someone saying to me, well, actually, it's 80 euros, and I didn't know that. Well, my nephews and nieces do the babysitting for us, and I can say you, you, I can say you could not get better and more reliable babysitters. They're brilliant. They're really... Re- do you know what you, I mean, you're going to leave your, your children with someone you know, or you're going yeah. to get a reliable source. Mm. You're, I mean, I would never go through the net or one of these babysitting agencies. I want referrals That's interesting. Well, you, that wouldn't, you wouldn't go to a babysitter.ie and pick no, out... No, I certainly would not. Why not? No, I wouldn't. Because, well, because I just wouldn't trust the references there. I'd want word of mouth of somebody that I know... And I would use the net for other things, but I certainly wouldn't use it for that, no. That's interesting, I'd want, some, yeah. I'd want to know somebody who was their daughter or someone who uses somebody frequently or something like that. Because, and depending on the, the age of your children, at this stage, my children are, are mainly grown up. I've one seven-year-old now, like, but, you know, for years, like, I've used babysitters. I've always had babysitters, but they've always certainly come from a reliable source. And do your, do your older children do babysitting for you? Um, no. They're rarely around, to be <laughs> honest, though. You've got to try and catch them. Right? I don't no. even bother yeah. asking, to be perfectly Not honest. Not at all. Not at all. Joking, no. you know? No. Not at all. No, they, they wouldn't anymore. You know what I mean? They just wouldn't want to be doing it. They've done it. My yeah. daughter has done it, and she kind of feels, no, hold on yeah, a minute. My, my, daughter, my, da- my daughter, my eldest daughter would do it occasionally, yeah. But um, I the think... Son, no way. No, I think most people... Uh, would you leave your son babysitting, would you? Yes, I would. Would you? I would. Fair yes, I would. You. But I mean, at this stage, he's 21. Jesus, Terry, if I couldn't trust him now, you know what I mean? But I would think it's more, uh, you get the kind of a more feminine touch, I suppose, from the females. And maybe I'm completely biased and wrong in that, but I just feel that the girls have more of a chance of giving them a cuddle or rocking the baby or whatever than a fellow would want to do if the child started playing up and crying. And, you know, I think they'd have more of a... No, there a are some fellas who, who, are, who are good at it. There's no doubt about it. It's just... Uh well, Certainly, but you know, I think if I left my eldest son out to be doing the babysitting, probably uh, maybe he'd be good at it. I'd just be afraid <laughs> he'd have one of his hip hop nights and he'd come back, the roof would be off the house or something. Noel, good morning to you. How are you? Morning, Jerry. How are yeah. things? Good. How are you? Great, not a bother. Well, I believe uh, we've been of some small service to you. Oh, it, it, was, uh, it was a massive service. A massive service, eh? Massive service. I didn't want to overstate it. I didn't want to blow too many trumpets. I didn't want to make it sound like I was, well, puffing myself up a bit. Well, credit where credit is due. Because I was just saying to um, one of your researcher yesterday, that we've we've got this six-month-old baby, and she's teething. And, yeah, so uh, she's, she's, to, to say contrary, she's not very contrary, but... She's not very happy. I know, it's a tough old time, it is. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it is very tough. And she's our yeah. first one as well. And, and uh, are the cheeks course, all red? And Oh, like two red plums, yeah. yeah. So, uh, like, of course, we, we, we didn't know what to expect. and uh, I suppose every day we're trying to make it better for her and the whole lot, you know. So we just, I, I, I came home from work one evening last week, and uh, the season that's in it, I, took, uh, I decided that I was going to take that trip up into the attic, you know. Yeah get the Christmas tree down, get the decorations down. So I said to get into the mood, we'd uh, get the Jerry Ryan's Christmas album going in the background, you know. So, of course, put it on. Uh, Faith, our little girl, was sitting in in the corner in her high chair and uh, looking pretty grim. And uh, so we put on the music. And what reminded me of it was yesterday you played uh, K-Star. Yeah. And I remember dancing around the... uh, the room, you know? Everybody's waiting for the man with the bag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, of course, uh, I, like, I, I was dancing around the sitting room. You know, the fire was roaring in the background, and uh, they, I started dancing around miming this song, you know, and, uh, of course, it knocked a great big smile out of, her, out of herself, you know. And I thought, God, this is brilliant. So just, I, de- I decided to give you a buzz and let you know that, <laughs> or let your listeners know that if anybody uh. has, anybody wants an, an antidote, for a teething baby, get the Jerry Ryan Christmas. Christmas well, album. well, of all the things that have been suggested by the record company, um, <laughs> our friends in EMI, um, and by Temple Street, who are getting the proceeds from the uh, sales of the album, nobody suggested that we would market Jerry Ryan's Christmas collection as a as an antidote to uh, teething children. But do you know what? It sounds like a good idea. Well, Anything you would do if you haven't a child, right? And you're listening this morning and you're wondering, 
how this man could be reduced to dancing around miming to K-Star on a Christmas album. Just wait until you get to that stage. If you're lucky enough, if God is good to you and you have a child of six months of age and the teeth are roaring red and the crying never stops and you would actually saw off your arm to put them out of their misery. Dennis, good morning. Morning, Jerry. How are you? I'm good, good. Babysitting. Well, we got usually, kind of fairly excited about it yesterday, didn't we? <laughs> we did indeed. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, on top of the cost of everything. I'm sure after prime time last night, people were robbing us out of money when we were what? buying houses. Can you remember? You were obviously listing yesterday. We had one woman who told us that she had paid a hundred and five dollars for three hours in Puerto Rico for a babysitter. Then we had another telling us that in New York, was it New York, was it? I can't remember. But anyway, they were charging like 10 euros per child. (laughs) Not 10 euros per hour, but 10 euros per child per hour. Anyway, your story. Sorry for interrupting you, Dennis. No worries. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, basically, we were, uh, both of us are uh, living in Dublin, but we're not from Dublin. So Mm -hmm. as you can imagine, uh, family resources aren't available too much. And my other half is actually from Sweden. So, uh, you know, you're always looking for a night out, regardless of a night out of the boys or a night out of the girls, looking for some dinner at a cinema. And uh, the going rate was 15 euros. So we said, well, fine, if everybody else is paying for it, sure, in for a penny. But uh, got a recommendation from a work colleague who's using, who uh, was uh, using this lady, and now he's using his, uh, his sister who's uh, old enough. And basically said, well, she's a very nice woman. And she charges 15 euros an hour and didn't say any more. And, uh, 50 the, euros an hour? 15. Well, oh, 15, yeah. And uh, the good lady arrived over on the Saturday night around 7 o'clock. Or I was, the, the missus was giving her the rundown of the house and, you know, what, what the little fellow was uh, likely to do. And he was just about to sleep. So the woman says, well, she said, you know, I'm not really a TV person. Um, she, I said, well, there's some CDs there or DVDs. She goes, no, no, really... She said, I'm very quiet, but I didn't bring any books. She said, do you, you know, do you have anything for me to do? I said, well, you know, housework, you mean? She goes, well, yeah, she was ironing, maybe. So I said, well, hold on a second. Ran up the stairs and brought down about 10, 15 shirts. I said, good boy. Are you sure you don't mind? She goes, no, no, no. She says, I don't have my sons anymore with me. So uh, she said, this will be nice and relaxing for oh, me. Oh, God, where are these women now? <laughs> they don't make them. She's not Irish. No, from the Philippines, actually. Very, very nice uh, lady. Now. Her daughter's actually living over here, which is why she moved here. But she came in. The little fella's going asleep. And she not only has the generosity of spirit to offer to do something else, but she has the intelligence to identify that maybe ironing your shirts <laughs> would be the correct thing to do. I'm not sure if it was a good reflection on myself. Dennis, she, there is a me. God. <laughs> and he's a man and he plays cricket. <laughs> Well, I didn't think there was a God since I got married, but, you know, now it's back on Just back be careful, be careful, Dennis. Back, backtrack on that, backtrack on that. You didn't mean to say that, sure you didn't. No, no, no. That was just kind of a mad spirit, thing. That was a mad thing. getting over me. Yeah, that was the mad 17-year-old thing in the back of your head that just came out the front of your gob, and you didn't mean to say it. Wayne, good morning to you. Jerry, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Um, I'm not great. I have a, I have a big problem. Wayne. <laughs> Okay. Wayne, Wayne, Wayne. I'm sure there's hundreds like me, but I'll tell you my story. I won't keep you too long. No, you can keep me as long as you like. Recently, I booked a holiday for my brother, the, his girlfriend, my wife and myself. Yeah. Um, it was t- it was for his birthday, 25. Yeah. But um, I, re- I only told him t- today, I only told him on Monday that, that we were going. Where are you going? We're going to New York. Fantastic. But uh, we're not going to New York. Why? Because he's absolutely petrified. He hasn't slept a wink since Monday, since I've told him that we're going. It just the, the, the thoughts of flying is absolutely terrifying. Terrifying him isn't the word for it. Now, I said I'd give you a ring. If you can't straighten him out and explain the law of averages to him and air safety and all the rest of it, if you can't do it, Jerry, I don't, nobody can. It's as simple as that. Wayne, did you know that he had a fear of flying? No, no. D- has he flown ever before? We went once, we went on a, a Ryanair flight to uh, to Liverpool years and years and years ago to watch a match. But um, he seemed to be fine with it. And uh, is he there, by the way? He's right beside me, yeah. I'll stick put him on. on, stick him on. Thanks, Jerry. Jerry, how are you doing? Joe. How's it going? It's good. Good. 
Now, uh, a lot of people sort of, you know, make fun of this particular sensation that you're experiencing and uh, find it very difficult to believe that anybody could pass up. What is it, two weeks in New York? Ten days, I think, yeah. Yeah. And you know what that city's like? Whoa. Yeah, it's, I've seen it on the telly a million times. And it's, oh, at this time of the year, it's the place to be. If I could do a Star Trek moment and just beam me up and be over there, I'd be over there in the next 10 minutes. But it's, the thought of that is just... It's, I'm absolutely... My hands are shaking holding the phone here thinking about it. And what, what in particular are you worried about? Uh, where do we start? The doors locking, just the uh, plane falling out of the sky. I have absolutely no chance whatsoever. And I know it sounds it's embarrassing even to say it. I sound like a like a child or something, but uh, Jesus, it's uh, it's just terrifying. No, you don't sound like a child, and there are lots of people who feel exactly like you do. Uh, some of them manage to get onto flights and um, make the journey because they have to. Usually, you know, a lot of people in business go through this and uh, live with the fear. Some of them conquer it partially; others fully. And then some not at all. Now, first of all, what you have to do is you have to think of what you're going to be missing out on. That's the first thing to think about, right? And that's probably not really all that, you know, it's not uppermost in your mind at the moment. You're, you're saying you'd love to go to New York. You're saying you've seen it on the telly. You're saying, God, I bet you it's great. And all that. But... 10 days in New York would be absolutely fantastic. So it's worth making the effort to get over this. That's the first thing, right? Yeah. Now, the second thing is, do you think you can do it? And what can be done to help you get onto the plane? Now, I presume that your brother Wayne has told you all the statistics. You know, I mean, you've more chance of being knocked down by a bus any day of the week than you have of anything happening to you on a flight. I know, I have everybody telling me that. You've got all the statistics and they mean nothing to you. I've read everything on the internet about statistics and plane crashes and uh, everything I've read. I've read into everything. I've looked at pictures and uh, what's made it worse is, is the Discovery Channel. Why? And all of these crash, plane, air crash seconds from disaster. It's oh, air crash investigation. That's quite good, actually, that program. I like that. Uh, wouldn't be good for you, though. No, it's the worst thing I've ever done. You weren't looking at that, were you? Yes, every every night there's a program on for the last two or three years nearly. I've been watching it, but... You've been, flung... you've been watching air crash inv- investigation for the last two or three years. That, yeah. that That's what's done it. I think so, because I've flown probably four or five years ago, and uh, we went to Liverpool for a weekend. It was 20 minutes. So I, know, I was okay. Like, I, was, I was a bit agitated now flying, but I was, it was okay. It's just the thought of doing this is just... I can't, I'll take a panic who, are you, who are you going to be flying with? It's Aer Lingus. So you'll be flying on the Airbus with Aer Lingus. Yeah. Now, you know that these uh, Aer Lingus have virtually an immaculate safety record. They are also obsessional about safety. The last Aer Lingus flight that I was on to the United States was uh, to go over to see uh, the Pirate Queen in Chicago, right? Yeah. And it was on an Airbus. And uh, I don't know what had happened. Something had happened to the cargo door. Now, they could easily have taken off w- w- with, without actually doing anything to it, but they wouldn't. They waited for an hour and a half on the tarmac until some nut and bolt was brought, just to be sure, to be sure, to be sure, to be sure. So that's the kind of airline you're dealing with. Yeah. They are obsessional about safety. Jerry Ryan.